as I prepare to share with you uh, essential details about proteins, I happen to have with me uh, one of my favorite uh, foods uh, that I enjoy. Uh, you can see what the product is, Nutella. This is delicious goodness. And uh, I have it with me well because I enjoy it, but it's also a good way of letting you know the usefulness of this kind of knowledge from a nutritional perspective. We have already talked about in class about carbohydrates, which in biology and in living things are going to be considered a primary source of energy, fuel. We've also learned that carbohydrates can be used for making other kinds of molecule cells we need. Uh, then we have talked about lipids, and lipids are not a direct source of energy. We usually don't call them fuel, but it's more like a storage of energy. Uh, that is going to be the function of those kinds of lipids we call fats, for example. And other lipids are going to be participating in the making of cell membranes, like in the case of phospholipids, or maybe even signaling proteins, like in the case of those steroids, like sex hormones. Uh, and uh, so again, why do I have my Nutella? Because you happen to see here uh, that it happens to have all of those uh, in, uh, molecules we've talked about, uh, carbohydrates, uh, there are fats, there are saturated fats, no surprise, uh, unsaturated fats as well. Uh, and, but there's also going to be protein here, and that's the thing we want to talk about, 2% protein. Uh, this is in Ruben's uh, book of, or list of uh, superfoods right there among the top. No, I don't work for the company, and I don't have any stock on Ferrero, which is a manufacturer of Nutella. I just really enjoy this stuff. So what's the deal with proteins? Proteins are going to be one of those uh, molecules that do just about everything in an organism. In fact, many people say that in order to build a living thing, you have to have proteins. And uh, your textbook does a beautiful job summarizing eight essential functions of proteins. Let me tell you that there are entire courses uh, that deal with uh, functions of proteins, structure of proteins, and that is not going to be the case here right now. We're just introducing them as one of those uh, macromolecules we can find in cells. Now you can see in your textbook uh, more details here at a glance. I just want to mention that uh, some proteins are going to be helping perform or, or catalyze. By catalyze, I mean speed up the rate of reactions. Sometimes cells need to break uh, two-part molecule. Here you have a disaccharide and an enzyme can be responsible for breaking it into the two monosaccharides. Some proteins are going to be functioning as storage. That'll be the example of uh, uh, al the albumin we find in eggs, uh, of albumin. It's going to be a more specific name and that is going to store all the essential amino acids uh, developing chick will need while it's developing inside of the shell of the egg. Other proteins are going to have defensive roles, like in the case of uh, antibodies that help us recognize and mark foreign invading cells in your body, like bacteria or even complex molecules like a virus, so we can get rid of them and not get sick or recover from a sickness or an illness that has resulted from one of these invasions. Other proteins are going to be helping transport materials from one side of the membrane to another side. In this case, you see a transport protein moving materials from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. Proteins also form like, uh, work like hormones, uh, like in the case of insulin that signals cells in your body when there is uh, sugar present in the blood so that cells can also take some of the sugar. Receptor proteins, like the ones that participate in the connections between nerve cells, and the receptor organs that are receiving the signals from the nervous system. Contractile proteins are going to be helping with locomotion, and structural proteins, uh, these are going to be helping provide support and uh, also protection to the cell inside and also structures outside of the cell. The example they mentioned here uh, is collagen. There are going to be uh, proteins like this one that uh, can help retain the shape of parts of your body. For example, I can take my glasses off and I can push my nose on one side and the moment I release it, it returns back to the original place and that is going to be because of these structural proteins like collagen 
and elastin that are featured over here. Uh, but uh, to summarize this, uh, there, are, there are thousands of proteins in the human body, and there will be thousands of functions for proteins as well. So what we can do is actually look at the roots, the origins for this versatility. The building blocks of proteins are called amino acids. So proteins are polymers. Polymers means many parts. And with 20 different types of amino acids that can be found in living things, and uh, polymers, which we call polypeptides, that can be of many different lengths and many different shapes, I am not kidding you when I tell you that the possibilities for the different kinds of proteins and their functions appear to be unlimited. What amino acids have in common, all 20, will be the following things. Now we're using this opportunity to review, once again, functional groups that we have to know. Here we have a carboxyl group, and uh, because of this carboxyl and the carboxylic acid nature of this building block, it is that we call it an amino acid, the acid part because of the carboxylic acid. The amino part of the amino acid comes from the other functional group we can recognize here, and that is going to be the amino group. These two, the amino group and the carboxyl group, are going to be attached to a central carbon that is going to be holding all of these parts of one amino acid together. The part where the 20 amino acids will be different will be only with regards to the side group uh, or side chain or functional group as, as, as we know, I'm, I'm sorry, side group or side chain. Uh, R group is another name we have for this uh, component of an amino acid. There are 20 amino acids, as I mentioned before. There's going to come a time in this class where we will have to know the names of these amino acids, the symbols and the abbreviations for these as well. Uh, but not right now. Right now, let's just continue exploring how do we make a protein. So proteins are going to be uh, structured at different levels. We now know that the amino acids are the building blocks. Many amino acids come together to form a polypeptide, which is going to be a higher level of structure. And how a polypeptide folds and how it interacts with other polypeptides eventually makes what we call a protein. How do we connect amino acids? That is something that can be seen in this illustration. Here we have one amino acid. You can see the parts, amino group. The carboxyl group was uh, used for making a bond here. This is going to be the R group or side chain. We can see better the parts of the amino acids here as we're trying to connect one more amino acid to these two that are already connected. Take a look, for example, here. This is going to be the carboxyl group, and this is going to be the amino group. The uh, oxygen and hydrogen on this part of the carboxyl group and this hydrogen from the amino are going to be going through that dehydration reaction that we are now familiar with. As a consequence, there is going to be a new bond between a carbon and a nitrogen. Here we see it. This special bond between a carbon and a nitrogen in a polypeptide is going to be known as a peptide bond uh, and is going to be one of those important bonds in biology. Proteins can be best studied when we look at the different levels of organization. When you look at a protein that is made up of hundreds of amino acids, the amino acids are going to connect one to another, remember, by dehydration reactions. There is going to be a peptide bond between two amino acids, and then we're going to have a long chain of them. However, there has to be a specific sequence of amino acids, specific types, uh, linked so that we can have the right function of a protein. So if we say, for example, that a polypeptide needs a ne no, next number of glycines and a next number of valines, those are different types of amino acids, you can't just mix them randomly or you will end up with something that has a weird shape and will have no function for the cell. So the primary structure of a protein is going to be the correct sequence of amino acids. Now I'm going to use the magnifying glass to show you better what I mean. In this particular protein, transthyretin, which is the example provided in the textbook, glycine has to be bonded first to proline. Now we have glycine and proline together. What should come next? Threonine has to come next. Then glycine again. 
And so this specific sequence of amino acids that must be connected to make a protein, that is going to be the primary structure of a protein or the polypeptide. Proteins, remember, are going to be polymers, many part molecules connected by uh, peptide bonds. But another detail that I want you to know is that unlike this illustration where you see like a, like a chain of amino acids connected, the amino acids of a polypeptide will never be on a straight chain. Or, or like in the fashion you see here in this illustration, the moment the ribosome of a cell continues to add more amino acids, those amino acids will begin interacting with one another in a way that they begin to fold and twist, beginning to form the three-dimensional shape of a protein. But before we get to that, there's going to be something we call the secondary structure. Look at these examples and see how amino acids begin to form sometimes what appears like a coil, kind of like a spring, uh, and uh, these types of uh, interactions forming this type of a core structure will be known as an alpha helix. Sometimes it will be like if you take a piece of paper and you begin folding it, folding it, those are going to be pleated sheets. Now, if you look up close, you will see that these structures, alpha helix and pleated sheet, will be the result of hydrogen bonds. We're going again into review mode. These hydrogen bonds are going to be like weak interactions between molecules or portions of a molecule. Here we see the oxygen that is being attracted to the hydrogen part of another amino acid. Now in reality here, these hydrogen bonds are happening between the core portion of the polypeptide, not the side groups, not the R groups, uh, but it's actually going to be the central part of the amino acid chain itself. Uh, and you can see that here. So you can see that a hydrogen uh, portion of an amino group is going to be attracted to the oxygen portion of the carboxyl uh, side of another amino acid. And so this is how those hydrogen bonds together, many of them can actually end up producing a strong and secure hold. One hydrogen bond by itself is not very strong, but many working together can actually make a quite well-structured uh, type of an object. So remember, <coughs> I apologize for that. I'm dealing with a little bit of a cold here. Primary structure is going to be the specific chain of amino acids. That chain of amino acids is important because it will be what determines the function of a protein. Now remember, the amino acids never stay like this, like, like in, a, in a straight chain, but they begin to coil or fold, and that is going to be the secondary structure. How amino acids in a portion of a polypeptide uh, interact in this fashion that produces alpha helices or pleated sheets. As we continue exploring, uh, when all of the amino acids in a polypeptide have been connected, you're going to end up with something we call the tertiary structure. And that is going to be the overall shape of a polypeptide. This polypeptide, remember, is going to be all the amino acids that are needed to uh, make eventually a protein. So that shape of the polypeptide, that is going to be the tertiary structure. What is interesting here is that this tertiary structure, watch this, not only includes the hydrogen bonds between oxygens and hydrogens of the core section of the amino acid chain, but now it's also going to include um, disulfide uh, interactions between the sulfhydryl group, our group in one amino acid, and the sulfhydryl group of another amino acid. Sulfhydryl groups are going to be among those functional groups we also need to know. Uh, there's also going to be ionic bonds that are going to be forming between certain kinds of amino acids. So covalent bonding, ionic bonding, hydrogen bonds, and on top of it all, van der Waals forces are also going to help 
put this molecule in, in a tight and well-defined shape. That shape we're talking about is the tertiary structure. Most proteins in our body are going to be of this nature. They're going to be just one polypeptide that is going to be one protein. But we have several other proteins that are actually made, like in the case of transthyretine, where four polypeptides are needed to make the entire functioning protein. And so when you take all of these four polypeptides and you put them together, now you're going to end up with that quaternary structure. And this is going to be the final folding of the protein. So tertiary structure is just the shape of one polypeptide. Quaternary structure is going to be when many polypeptides come together to form that final folded protein. And sometimes we have globular proteins and sometimes we're going to have fibrous proteins. There is an activity worksheet that I have prepared for you and I gave you uh, in class. I will be, uh, take a look at the, at the handouts I give you in class. You'll find one that deals with protein structure. I will be making a key that you can use to verify your work. But first, I want you to work on that worksheet, apply these concepts we just covered, and then, then take a look at the key and see how you did. I think uh, for now, that is all I have to say about proteins. And uh, I'll see you the next, uh, at the next class meeting. Goodbye.